is the Banner Baseball Show. Paul Mancano and Danielle Allen Tuck. After opening weekend, we are here in rainy Baltimore, hoping that the rain stays away tonight, tomorrow, and Wednesday as the Orioles begin a three-game series against the Kansas City Royals. But we got to look back on the first weekend of baseball. Danielle, what a weekend it was for the Orioles. They almost came away with a sweep of the LA Angels. We're going to talk about Corbin Burns' terrific uh, start on opening day and what his presence on the Orioles means for this team. We're also going to talk about Gunnar Henderson starting the season with a bang, maybe the beginning of an all-star season for the shortstop slash third baseman. Uh, but first, Danielle, overall takeaways, at least from the first two games, that it's always difficult to sweep a team, even one is kind of more abundant as the uh, LA Angels. But the first two games... The Orioles outscore the Angels 24 to 7. They dominate the Angels pitching staff. They fall in game three, but boy, does this team look good through the first three games of the season. Yeah. And I mean, their bats looked awesome in spring training, too. So, I mean, if you watched them all spring, you wouldn't be surprised by the offensive production that they had this weekend. But seeing it in a real game was just astonishing. And knowing that, you know, D's nine, like I, I tweeted this out, but they put in Colton Kowser, one of the top prospects in the nation uh, in like the seventh inning of a blowout game. And this team is so deep that they're at the point where their top prospect isn't even starting games yet. Yeah. So they are an incredible team to watch. I, I think if they can keep, they're not going to obviously score 14 runs every game, but if they can keep that offense up all year, they're going to be really, really fun this year. Yeah. It was just the amount of different guys contributing. Mm -hmm to the offense, at least through the first two games. And, and they obviously hit a little bit of a, a wall in game three. Uh, but the first two games, at least, I mean, Anthony Santander hitting a couple homers. Uh, Adley Rutschman absolutely loves opening day. I mean, you know, two is probably a coincidence. Maybe if he does it next year, then that's a trend. But he has been phenomenal in his first two opening days of his big league career. Uh, he had three hits in the first two games. Um, he just loves getting off to a hot start. Uh, all these guys were contributing to the point where it was a blowout in game one. It was a blowout in game two. Uh, and this offense really looks like it can, you know, be competitive again in the AL East. I think of a guy like Anthony Santander that, you know, once again, another offseason where people were looking at a, him being a potential trade piece. But you think about what he brings offensively every time he steps on the field and hits a home run you're reminded of just how important he is for the offense. And same with Ryan Mountcastle. I think a guy that kind of gets overshadowed by guys like Gunner and Adley, but another guy that just every time he's, he is in the lineup, he produces, he, he's hitting balls off the top of the wall. Unfortunately, not for him clearing the great wall of Baltimore, uh, but he is so productive at the plate and it's the depth of this lineup that makes them so scary for AL East opponents. I mean, every player in the first two games who came up the hit got on base. So it just shows you how deep they are. And I think they had like all but one bench player play in each of those games. So they used 12 different position players uh, in both of those first two games. But I mean, I think people forget Anthony Santander. He led the team in home runs last year, tied with Gunnar Henderson with, I believe, 28. So like he's no schmo himself. He is, you know, the power leader of this team and has been for a couple of years. And Ryan Mountcastle, some bad luck there. I think both of those doubles that he hit on Saturday would have been home runs in just about every other stadium. Uh, yeah. But he also had a couple walks, which was great, and walks in big spots, which were really impressive for him. Yeah, for a guy that uh, the only knock on him really offensively has been his plate discipline at times. And hopefully it holds up. You know, we're not we're trying not to draw too many conclusions from the first three games of the season. However, it is encouraging to see signs like this, uh, to see the offense perform like this uh, going up against, you know, the Angels best uh, players as uh, the dog in my apartment whines in the background. Hopefully nobody's hearing that. Uh yeah, so the offense is incredible. The fact that they score 11 runs in the first game, 13 runs in the second game, and prompt Angels manager Ron Washington to call the earliest team meeting, I think, in, in baseball history. Two games in, he has to have a closed-door team meeting to discuss everything that went wrong through the first two games. Usually, you, you at least save that for May or June when things are going off the rails. But the fact that the Orioles bludgeon the angels so sufficiently through those first two games and maybe the angels 
got heard it from that veteran manager in Ron Washington and, and were able to turn things around in game three. And that's why they won that game. But it, it, they just utterly outplayed the angels in those first two games. They did. And I, I asked a question, I mean, the, or, are the Orioles really good or are the angels really bad? And I think it's kind of a case of both in this situation. I mean, yeah. the Orioles, looked awesome in those first two games. The Angels, though, did make a number of mistakes that kind of led to that point. And I, I would assume that's what the team meeting was about, was just kind of eliminating some of those mistakes. And they, they did play a cleaner game on Sunday. Uh, yeah. So that clearly did help out for the Angels. But, I mean, the Orioles were just putting on a show. I mean, it looked like it was spring training still. And they were playing against, you know, the eighth <laughs> inning pitcher who, you know, hasn't pitched above high A. Like, that's how dominant they were in those first two games. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about Corbin Burns because he was as advertised at least through one start and he's hoping to make about 30 plus more of those this season needed just 82 pitches to get through six innings allowed one hit. It was a solo Homer to the best player in baseball. Maybe, maybe the second best player in baseball in Mike Trout did not walk a batter struck out 11. Danielle, we've talked about Corbin Burns, how he raises the ceiling of this team and you insert him at the top of a potential playoff rotation that changes the entire look of the Orioles pitching staff, but he was absolutely the guy that they traded for at least through the first start of the season. And I think fans maybe who didn't get to watch a whole lot of him in spring training or didn't watch a whole lot of him in Milwaukee because he's in the NL as opposed to the AL got a good look at who Corbin Burns has been the last three all-star seasons. And he is a capital A ace. Yeah, I mean, he was stellar on Thursday in his opening day start. And I think that the thing that, you know, really presses me about him as a veteran versus, you know, some of the younger guys is he did give up that home run to Mike Trout. I believe it was in the first inning. And then yeah. he didn't let it hold him back at all. I mean, he went on and didn't allow another base runner for the rest of the game. So that to me just shows, you know, kind of competitor he is. You know, he made a mistake. Mike Trout is an incredible pitcher, took advantage of it. And you know, you wouldn't even tell from Corbin Burns. The next pitch, you know, was great. And he made it through the rest of the game seamlessly. And I think kind of an underrated thing about what Corbin Burns brings to this rotation is not only how he pitches, but how, you know, the rest of the pitchers are kind of getting inspired by him. You know, Grayson Rodriguez, who had a great start of his own on Saturday uh, in his first start of the season, was saying that, you know, Corbin Burns is kind of like, okay, it's your turn, Grayson, like kind of smack talking him to pump him up now. So there's that little bit of competitiveness now at the top of the rotation where they want to try to run up each other each start. Yeah. I mean, people were, th you know, th obviously looking at Kyle Bradish as uh, a potential ace last year because he finished fourth in Cy Young voting. He was terrific, but he is not the veteran that Corbin Burns is. He does not have as many years under his belt. He is still figuring a lot of things out just as Grayson Rodriguez is, just as Dean Kramer is, just as some of these other young guys in this rotation. Corbin Burns has been there and he's done that. And he's won a Cy Young and he's been to three all-star games. He is a legitimate ace. And to have that kind of anchor at the top, that if you get in a, let's say, maybe not even the playoffs, let's say we get into a September series against the Yankees and you need it to win the division, you feel so good about giving somebody like Corbin Burns the ball in the first game of that series. Um, I was thinking back to, and I, I tweeted this out from at All Banner Sports during Corbin Burns' start that he is the best Oriole starting pitcher since dot, dot, dot. And I, and I clarified starting pitcher because I think maybe Zach Britton who finished uh, sixth, I believe in Cy Young voting and his best season uh, could be considered, you know, one of the better pitchers period in the, in recent Orioles history, but Corbin Burns being the best starter since. And I have to go back to Mike Messina. Yeah. I don't think there's a single guy. Yes. Bradish had garnered Cy Young votes last year, but we need to see a few more years of him uh, doing that. And I, I'm not saying just production wise, because Corbin Burns only has one production or one start, I should say, with the Orioles so far. But in terms of quality of pitcher, I can't think of a better starting pitcher in the 21st century than Corbin Burns. I mean, Mike Messina's last year with the Orioles was the year 2000 before he went over to the Yankees. It's it's probably him. And then 24 years of so-so pitching and Corbin Burns. Yeah. And I mean, I agree with you that I think Kyle Bradish probably has the potential to do that. And he did go back to Sarasota over the weekend to continue his rehab. He's expected back 
sometime in the first half of the season. We'll see what happens with that. But, you know, Kyle Bradish is just that one stellar season. Uh, the thing about presses me with Corbin Burns so much is that not only does he have the stuff, he has the durability. Uh, you know, he's pitched over 200 innings in a season. He regularly gets up to 180, 190 innings. So not only is he always pitching at a high level, he's doing it for the whole season at a really productive rate. You know, he's combining your best pitcher on your staff with a war course like Kyle Gibson and Jordan Lyles. He had the best two years. He can do both of that, which is yeah. just incredible and a great addition to the staff. Yeah, no, it, that those six innings, I would not get used to uh, Corbin Burns being done after six innings. I think that was just a case of the Orioles did not need any more innings because they were absolutely destroying the Angels at that point. They only needed those 82 pitches. Um, and he hasn't I, pitched above that yet this year. So they're kind of, they're being right. a little careful. You know, they didn't need him, like you said. So why push him above what his pitch count has been? Exactly. But come September, come October, hopefully for Orioles fans, I expect him to be taking the ball once every five, six days and going at least six, maybe seven, eight innings, because that is the kind of pitcher he is. He is a legitimate workhorse, like you said, in addition to providing the best quality innings on this right. team. I mean, I, you know, I think of uh, other Orioles pitchers in the last 24 years that could have fit this bill. And I, I really can't think of anybody. I think of a couple guys that became you know, Cy Young caliber pitchers after they left the Orioles, Kevin Gaussman, Jake Arrieta. But other than that, I mean, this is a guy that uh, the likes of which Orioles fans have not seen for a long time. And you just hope that because he only has one year under contract, uh, because they need him to be good this year, you hope he stays healthy and you hope that he continues to produce because he just changes the entire complexion of this Orioles team. He really does. And you think that they're doing this without two of their best starters and John Meads and Kyle Bradish. So imagine when those two guys are back in a couple months and you can push, you know, to the starters you have your rotation yeah. now to the bullpen, have that extra depth. I mean, just it opens up so many avenues for this team at this point. Yeah. And we'll touch on uh, John Means's rehab start down in Norfolk in just a bit. But offensively, Danielle Gunnar Henderson mm -hmm. led the way. Uh, he was phenomenal over the weekend. Three games. Four hits, one homer, one triple, three walks, four RBIs, made a couple stellar plays at shortstop, especially in Sunday's game. He's looking for not just the gold glove. He's looking for an all-star appearance. He hasn't had one yet in his career. Of course, only he's played only you know a year and a month. Uh, but he's looking to maybe garner some MVP votes, I think, this season. And I know it's very, very, very early to be even discussing that. But just looking at the quality of player, looking at what he can do for this team offensively and defensively, he's going to produce, if he stays healthy, at least another five war season, I think, and maybe more. He is putting himself uh, on the map and he's putting himself in the in the ranks of some of the better shortstops in baseball. Yeah, and I think the thing that really impressed me about Gunner this weekend is, you know, we've seen him perform at the plate many times, you know, after he got off to that bad start last year from really mid-May on to the rest of the year, this was just an average series for him. You know, he was doing this regularly. I mean, on Saturday, he almost hit for the cycle and may have if they had left him in the game, but yeah. they decided to take him out and rest him, a decision that he said he agreed with. It's a long season, doesn't want to burn himself out. But I was most impressed with his defense at shortstop because it's a position he grew up with, but one that he hasn't regularly played in the majors. They're going to have him be their starting shortstop throughout the season this year, which I think having him steady at one spot will also raise his profile that much more uh, in yes. the gold glove and MVP conversation. But the play that he made on Sunday is maybe one of the best plays I've seen him ever make in the majors. Um, the diving catch and, and then the diving throw to get the runner out at first in yesterday's game. I mean, that was just incredible. And he was, you know, he didn't even think twice about it. It was so calm for him, so natural. So I'm really looking forward to seeing the steps that he takes forward at defense this year. I think that's where we're going to see the biggest growth out of him. Yeah, and, and a guy who it wasn't that long ago when he was a prospect, mm -hmm. a lot of scouts were saying he's going to have to move to third base because mm -hmm. he's just too big to play shortstop. And a guy mm -hmm. that, that played so few games compared to others, other top prospects in the minor leagues. You know, he was a, a high school draft pick back in 2019 and he makes his big league debut at the end of the 2022 season. And for him to be as good defensively as he is already in his career 
at his age, at his level of experience, just shows that he is a special type of talent. Mm -hmm. it, it is rare that you get that kind of level of defense already without mm -hmm. having to, you know, play multiple seasons in triple A or double A uh, right. and to get to where he is at the maybe the toughest defensive position on the diamond is mm -hmm. really impressive. Um, yeah, could be coming for that gold glove. I know the, the AL is incredibly stacked with infielders. I mean, Texas has Marcus Simeon and Corey Seager, and they already have, you know, multiple all-stars uh, in their infield already. But Gunnar Henderson, I think what he's going to do offensively, he hits that leadoff homer in the second game of the series on a pitch that was below the zone and puts it out over the right center field wall. Uh, what he's going to do offensively, what he's going to do defensively, he is establishing himself as one of the better all around players uh, in baseball right now. And it's incredibly yeah. fun to watch. Yeah. And don't forget that he's also fast. Like he has speed yes. too on the base bats. Yeah. What's crazy is he's look at his stack cast numbers from last year. I think he's in the 99th percentile mm -hmm. in base running value, which is yeah. absurd. I mean, you would think Jorge Mateo would be in that kind of upper echelon, but no, it's Gunnar Henderson, somebody who never had 80 grade speed or 75 grade speed in the minors but he is incredibly fast and he mm. knows how to use his speed uh, really at an elite that. level. And, and you see little things from him too, just in his competitive drive. He had went one for four, I believe on opening day. And he goes back to the dugout after he grounds out and slams his helmet mm -hmm. down. It's like, you are four at bats into the season. You have a long way to go. You're going to be were just fine. Like 10 to one at that point. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, that is how he is. That is how he is wired. And that's exactly mm -hmm what you want from a guy who is going to be uh, a centerpiece of this mm -hmm. team for years to come. So exciting. What an exciting start of the season for Gunnar mm -hmm. Henderson. Um, let's talk about some prospects that we saw perform very well for Norfolk, who is gunning for their second straight national championship. I mean, let's be honest, the tides have to be the favorite to win the championship again, given how good this team has been uh, through the first three games of the season, how loaded they are, even without guys like Joey Ortiz, uh, D.L. Hall, this team still has Kobe Mayo and Jackson Holiday, the number one prospect in baseball. They still have Heston Kerstad. They are absolutely loaded to the gills with top prospects. Uh, Kobe Mayo and Jackson Holiday right now through the first three games of the season for Norfolk. Both hitting 357. And Jackson Holiday's first at bat in Norfolk this year begins with a homer off a left-handed pitcher. Mm -hmm. And Danielle, that was the one thing that Mike Elias said he had to work on in addition to maybe a little bit more extra time playing second base, mm -hmm. but hitting left-handed pitching, he didn't perform particularly well against lefties in spring training. And what do you know? He hits a home run off a lefty in his first game of the season. I mean, that was quite the statement. He was literally mm -hmm. saying uh, pre-game to our colleague, Andy, who was at the game that he knows what he has to do in AAA to get called up and it's hit lefties. So what does he do mm -hmm. in his first at bat of the season? Hits a home run off a lefty. Uh, you just look, at the top five in that tied starting lineup, I don't remember the order, but it was Kobe Mayo, Jackson Holiday, Heston Kirk said, uh, Connor Norby, and Kyle Stowers. And you just, yeah, those five are major leaguers on any other team at this point. <laughs> yeah. And you can say maybe some of their defenses aren't up to where they need to be, but on any other team, they could at least be a DH right now, which is how good they are. So that tied team is stacked. We're going to see them all at some point this season, I would imagine, but. I mean, just going back to how deep this Orioles team is, the quality of guys they have in AAA is just insane right now. They just don't even have the space for them on their major yeah. league team. They don't even have the space to play Colton Kowser right now every day. So right. they are just so deep right now. Yeah, and, and you, on one hand, you want to say the Orioles should try to maximize this talent and use them in trades to get major league ready players. But on the other hand, I think we're going to see over the course of 162 – that injuries will take their toll on big league players. And when guys have to miss significant time, the prospects are going to be incredibly valuable to have to come up and play, right. you know, important games in the middle of the summer. You know, I think of when Cedric Mullins went down for a couple months last year, if that were to happen again, if they were to lose another outfielder, they have Heston Kerstad, they have Kyle Stowers, two guys that could come right up and be ready to go. If they lose Jorge Mateo for an extended amount of time or Jordan Westberg, they have Connor Norby, who's ready to come up, or Kobe Mayo, who can come up and play. So those guys are going to be valuable. Right now, knock on wood, the Orioles haven't had 
too many injuries position player wise. You know, they're still waiting for Means and Bradish to come back. Uh, but position player wise, they've been relatively healthy. But once they suffer injuries, that's the advantage that the Orioles have. That's the way the Orioles were able to win 101 games last year. They may not have had as many superstars as teams like the Yankees or even the Blue Jays in their division, but they had far much more depth than any team in the American League East and I think any team in baseball. So you want the Orioles to try to capitalize on that, and I get that. And if a trade for a starting pitcher and even another starting pitcher not one of Corbin Burns's caliber likely, but another starter who could fill out this rotation were to materialize. I think Elias would pull the trigger, but I think he also realizes that these prospects are going to have to play games at some point. They may look like they're stuck in AAA right now, but he's going to call on them at some point when injuries take their toll. I also, I mean, if they get to the point where it's close to the trade deadline or even June or July, and they realize that they need, you know, another guy in the bullpen or even another starter, I, I think the Orioles are at the point now where Michael Elias is willing to make that move. We saw him in the offseason to get Corbin Burns. I, I think we're at the point now where he's okay parting with some of them if he can get the return that he thinks the team needs. But at this point, you know, there's nothing glaring that they have to do. They, ha- they don't have any gapping holes yet. Right. Uh and like like you said, once the pressure is on and there is a timetable of you got to get a deal done at some point, maybe we will see a deal like that materialize. A uh, couple other notes from uh, down on the farm. John Means made his uh, first, really his first uh, start of the spring. It, you know, consider this his first spring training start because he never appeared in a game in Sarasota. And uh, he got hit very hard. Seven earned runs, six hits in just one plus inning. It's not what you want, but Danielle, I don't think either of us are in panic mode about uh, John Means' first real appearance of the year. Yeah. I mean, think about it like a first spring training start. I mean, the stats don't matter. All that matter was him getting out there and throwing. He was going to throw right. about one to two innings, just like a starter does in her first spring training appearance. So I don't think you start to panic until the end of his 30-day rehab stint. Yeah, yeah. At that point, then you start to get a little concerned. Um, Tyler Nevin is no longer in the organization. He, as you may recall, was placed on uh, waivers right before the season started so the Orioles could get Tony Kemp. Uh, and Nevin has been claimed by the Oakland A's, so he is gone. Uh, Honestly, CNL Perez, what's that? A great spot for Nevin. He's going to get a play every day. Yeah. No, yeah. that's exactly what what you would want. Like, he must have, I, I'm sure he has good feelings about the Orioles, who, you know, he made his uh, big league debut with a couple years ago. But, I'm sure he's probably a little happy to be somewhere where there's not a complete log jam uh, right. at third and first in a corner outfield, which are the positions he plays. Mm-hmm. Um, other than that, uh, CNL Perez suffered that oblique strain at the worst time in the second game of their three game series uh, in the ninth inning, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, and he is headed to the IL with an oblique strain. And uh, Jonathan Heasley came up from Norfolk. It's, it's tough because, uh, CNL Perez was looking maybe for a slight bounce back year after last year. He wasn't as good as he was in 2022 and uh, oblique strains can keep you out for a while. They didn't offer a timetable, but we've seen guys miss multiple months with oblique strains and you hope that's not the case for the lefty. Right. We don't know anything more yet. Uh, it just happened. He just got placed on I know yesterday morning, right before the game. Um, but I would imagine it would be probably about a month if I could guess, because 15 days about pitching and then, a little bit more time to ramp up. But Jonathan Heasley had a good camp. He was one of the last guys cut in spring training. So they were pretty impressed with him. Um, I don't know what role he'll use yet, be used in yet, but I imagine he'll be kind of, you know, the early inning guy right after the starter gets taken out. Yeah. Uh, and the Orioles had just sent Nick Vespi down. So that was a lefty that, uh, you know, they had just sent back down to AAA Norfolk because he got called up to take the place of Jacob Webb, who was on the paternity list to start the season, which congrats, Jacob. Uh, Mm -hmm. But that was a a weird roster uh, turnover already. So it's another example of how the opening day roster isn't anything more than the roster on the very first game of the season. It is just, you know, it is just that. It changes so quickly. And I think we're going to see more changes uh, over the coming weeks. Uh, But Danielle, three-game series against the Kansas City Royals now a Royals team that is hoping to be a whole lot better than they have been in the last few seasons. Uh, they got a massive win, I believe on Sunday as well. 
this is uh, not the same type of Royals team that the Orioles have had their way with uh, in 2023 and even back in 2022. No, they're not. They're so much deeper now. Kind of their young talent has matured into, you know, stars of the league now. Bobby Wood Jr. is also one of the best young guys, you know, in the AL at this point. Um, I'm very intrigued this series to see how Dean Kramer and Cole Irvin do in their first starts. We'll get another look at Corbin Burns on Wednesday, but Kohler Irvin in particular made a lot of changes in the offseason, as we have discussed, and it, he looked really good in spring, but nothing counts until you get into a real game. So it should be a really interesting series. Hopefully the rain uh, doesn't impact it at all. Yeah. Uh, Kramer tonight, Irvin mm -hmm. tomorrow, Burns in the afternoon game on Wednesday. But like you said, Danielle, let's just hope that the rain holds off. It looks like it might be OK for tonight. It's the, the biggest questions are going to be Tuesday and Wednesday. So we'll see. Uh, but at D underscore Allen Tuck is Danielle's Twitter handle, and she will keep you covered as well as Andy Casca at AF Casca for him. I'm at Paul Mancano and at All Banner Sports. We've got so, so much more coverage for the Baltimore Orioles on the BaltimoreBanner.com, where you can subscribe $1 for six months to read all of the great stories from over the weekend. Uh, Danielle, do you have a favorite story? I'm going to put you on the spot. Do you have a favorite story that you've written in the first uh, week of the season? Oh, I, it's coming out tomorrow, so stay tuned. Okay. Yeah. Oh, exciting one. What a tease. Yeah. Okay. Uh, great stuff coming from uh, Danielle and Andy and Jamioli and Kyle Goon, all at thebaltimorebanner.com. Thanks so much for tuning in. Please like, review, rate, subscribe. Uh, tell the everybody about uh, the Banner mm -hmm. Baseball Show. If you write us a good review, we'll also read it out here on the podcast and subscribe anywhere that you do get your podcasts. Tune into the Banner Baseball Show. For Danielle Allentuck, I'm Paul.